Appreciate the break. I'm going to call Kevin Miller to the stand, please. Before you sit down, Gary, that's fine. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony is not to be given this matter is the truth? The whole truth is nothing but the truth. I do. Please proceed to Derek. You would. 
After you get settled there, if you could kind of scoot up to the microphone. Perfect. If you could state your name, spelling your first and your last name for the record, please. My name is Kevin Miller, K-E-V-I-N-M-I-L-L-E-R. Good. And I see that you're wearing a uniform today. Where are you currently employed, sir? Uh, the city of Linwood as a paramedic firefighter. Okay. And we'll go through what each of that those mean in a minute. Mm -hmm. But how long have you worked for the city of Linwood doing that? i uh, worked for the city for 18 years. Any previous experience before that? I was a volunteer resident firefighter for a neighboring jurisdiction for another three and a half years prior to coming to the city of Linwood. So a little over 21 years? Correct. Please explain the, the training and, and any schooling that you might have uh, that allows you to hold that position within the city of Linwood. Uh, as it pertains to my role as a paramedic. We'll start with that. Uh, um, so I attended paramedic school at, uh, through the Seattle Fire Department and Harborview Medical Center uh, approximately four and a half years ago. Um, that training is a solid year where you're actually assigned to the program. You don't work shifts for the city during that time. And um, it's, it's actually regarded as one of the best paramedic programs in the nation. Um, so upon completion of that program, uh, you're then certified as a paramedic in the, in the state. And then, and then you, you move on and, and take your county protocol tests when you come back to your home department. And be certified in for for me Snohomish County. Okay. Um, along with that, there's there's continuing education and ongoing training that we do routinely. Right. So I'm assuming this is something that you use uh, every day in the course of your job. Yes. Um, probably 95 percent of the time I'm at work. I'm on the medic unit. Okay. And what does it mean exactly to be a paramedic? I mean, we I, it, it's a term that we throw around, but what does mm -hmm. it mean? What can you do? Okay, so as a paramedic versus, uh, say, an emergency medical technician, uh, paramedics are given the ability to essentially be the physician's hands and eyes and ears on a scene because there's no one else there to do it. We read EKGs, uh, we can establish IV access, push medications, we can uh, intubate a patient if necessary. We can uh, do a lot of things on scene that in a hospital setting only physicians do. So. And does that role uh, require you to assess injuries when you arrive to, uh, say, a fire where somebody may have been in a fire? Yes. Okay. And you also mentioned that you're a firefighter? I am. Okay. And I think that may be a little self-explanatory, but talk to us about how you became a firefighter. With regards to the training leading up yeah. to it, um, so when I initially uh, hired on as volunteer back in it was 90, 1994, 95, um, there was a recruit academy that we went through um, just to get our initial training, and then with everything else in our profession, there's ongoing training that comes along with that, um, and then in, in uh, 1996, I went through the Washington State Fire Academy, which is, I believe at that time was nine weeks, where you, you essentially live at the academy and 24-7 and training. Um, and then since that time, it's just been continual education, training, drills. And, and we're actually a very busy fire department, so we, we have a pretty good call load. Yes. And, and which fire department, or where are you located as far as your fire department? Well, the city of Linwood. Um, the station I primarily run out of is our headquarters, and it's at 44th Avenue and 188th Street. And then we have one other station on the other side of town at 68th and 188th. Are you able to give an estimation uh, over the course of your 20 year, 21 year career as to how many actual house fires you've responded to? Uh, probably not an accurate number. Um, you know, me personally, um, probably a handful each year. Uh, well, a handful of legit, active, you know, fully involved house fires. 
Yeah. We go to a lot of a lot of little fires, put food on the stove, and things like that. But, but a fully engulfed house fire a few each year, you said? Yes. Okay. Now, were you working on November 16th, 2014? Uh, was that the date of this incident? Yes, I was. Okay. And uh, do you recall this incident? I do. Um, actually, I'd like to have my, uh, my statement you, up here if I did, could. Did you write a report? I did. Okay. So I'm going to hand you what's been marked as mm -hmm. State's Exhibit Number 40. Do you recognize that, sir? I do. And what is that? So this is the statement I wrote after the after the call. Okay. And then behind that is the medical report that I wrote because I was the lead paramedic in charge of treating uh, Ms. Welch. Okay. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is, is to kind of turn that over. And if you need to refer to it for okay. a pressure collection, we can do that. But let's see if you can go based on what you remember about this incident. Mm -hmm. Um, describe how you would have been called out to this incident. Uh, initially, we were... that how he would have as opposed to what in fact did happen. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Describe how you were called out to this incident. All right. Um, I was assigned to Medic 15 that night, and uh, we were dispatched as part of the primary response for a structural fire. Okay. And when you are responding to this, mm -hmm. are you aware whether or not you're going to be um, in a firefighter capacity or a paramedic capacity before you arrive? No, initially um, we knew from the report that the, the house was, I believe the report was fully involved. Um, we did not know that there was any patients at that point to treat, so um, when we pulled up to the scene, we were putting our bunker gear on and uh, our initial plan was to go fight fire. Okay. And how quickly were you able to respond to this address? Almost immediately. Okay. And was this address located in the city of Linwood? Yes. And was it in the state of Washington? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what has been marked as state's exhibit number 37. Have you previously seen this map, sir? Yes. And what are we looking at here at state's exhibit 37? So that looks like a aerial view of the location in question where the fire occurred. Okay. And so we'll be talking about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but is that a, you've previously seen that? Yes. Is that a true and accurate depiction of the scene uh, of Linwood there? I believe so. And of this, this mm -hmm. incident we're about to talk about? Yes. And you're on a state move to admit State's Exhibit 37. If I could just very briefly board here on the exhibit 37. Briefly. Harmon uh, Miller, you yourself didn't generate that diagram, did you? No, I did not generate that diagram. And you didn't label the street names on there, uh, did you? There no, I, I did not. Okay. And when you saw that, those were already on there? Correct. But are you able independently to recognize that as the scene where this fire took place? Yes, it looks like the scene to me. Okay, I have no objection. Exhibit 37 is admitted. Were you on the first engine to arrive? No, I was on the paramedic unit. I believe we were second or third emergency vehicle to, to arrive there. Uh, there's one station that's closer than, than we were. So. Describe the scene as you arrive. What was going on? Uh, so, so as we arrived, uh, being that we were in a, a medic unit and not a fire engine, we actually parked um, just around the corner there um, to the north. And uh, so this red button is oh, okay. a laser pointer. So, <coughs> all right. So, so initially when we arrived, we let's see if I can get this done. That's had a terrible thing. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to stand up and can all the jurors see? Oh, okay. All right. 
Yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, okay. So, Mr. Stern's got a uh, pointer there. All right. We'll bring this over. Point your stuff there. Okay. I need you to speak up. Before. Okay. So, initially, when we arrived to the scene, um, we, we placed the medic unit roughly in this, this position here. Uh, so, we could finish putting our breathing apparatus on and, and uh, grabbing tools and equipment to move forward to the scene, I believe. I believe the house that was on fire was this one with multiple roof lines. Um, would you like to know where we went from there? Because please. Um, so while we were while we were getting our equipment, then over the radio, the lieutenant who was on the first engine to the scene radioed to us asking specifically for us to move forward because he had an injured person. And who was that lieutenant? Uh, it was Lieutenant John Putz. Okay. And so so at that time. We then moved the medic unit closer to the scene, somewhere roughly in here, um, and we couldn't get any further because the supply hose was was in the road, and and so it, it's four inches big. We can't drive over it, um, so that was as close as we could get. And then uh, uh, we went forward to to see what was going on. Okay, thank you very much. Now. What have you been trained to do when you arrive at a fire such as this? Uh, initially, if we're going to be actively fighting fire. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put on our breathing apparatus. We're going to grab our passport tags, which identify the vehicle you're coming off of and the crew. And we're going to grab some hand tools and we're going to move forward to the command post and report for assignment. Now, you have indicated that you received word from Lieutenant Putz that, uh, mm -hmm. that there was somebody injured? Yes. And so, so how does that change your role when you're training and what you're going to do? So, so essentially, he, he was indicating that someone was injured, and he needed us to switch gears into the paramedic role. Okay. And so what do you do to do that? Um, so at that point, we positioned the, our vehicle closer, um, since that's, that's essentially our office. That's that's where our equipment is. That's where our tools are. Um, and then from there, I believe we uh, brought a gurney forward, knowing that we were going to be transporting someone off the scene, and we were going to be treating and transporting. And at the point when you're bringing the gurney, did you know have any idea what extent of injuries there were at all? No. Okay. Um, is it standard protocol to bring that gurney and do that regardless of the injuries? Um, there's no, no standard protocol for it. It's, it's just experience driven. Um, and, and, so, and what do you mean by that? Uh, <clears throat> knowing that this was a, a house fire, full involved house fire, um, we're assuming that there's going to be significant injuries. And, okay. So what happened when you arrived at the fire? So when I initially approached the scene, uh, <clears throat> Lieutenant Putz was, uh, in the vicinity of the front bumper of engine 14, which was the first fire engine on scene. And uh, and where was that located in relation to the house? Uh, in front of the house, out in the street. Okay. Right. So um, he was there, and uh, he was uh, trying to question uh, Mr. Morgan. And you sort of gave a head nod there. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see anybody on scene uh, that night who was located in the courtroom today? Yes, Mr. Morgan, the and defendant. Could you point that person out describe something in the right in a purple shirt with a purple tie. If you could uh, have the record reflect, he's pointing out the defendant, Mr. Morgan. Record will reflect. Okay. Who was making contact with him? Uh, Lieutenant John Putz. Could you hear anything that they were saying? Uh, yes, some of it, um, because then I became involved in the conver in the interaction, uh, you know, as a means to initiate treatment. And so, describe that contact with the defendant. So, um, the defendant appeared. He was when I approached. He was, as I recall, laying on his side on the ground. <clears throat> um, Lieutenant Putz was trying to question him as to if there was. Uh, anyone else left in the in the home? If there was any other possible victims there, 
Um, that's one of the things we'll try to do when we, we go to a fire is get a total head count of how many people we need to be looking for, if any, or if everybody's out, you know, that, that can change our tactics significantly. And I don't think, I, where is this conversation taking place? You said near the fire. The, the front bumper of Engine 14. Okay, yeah, thank you. In front of so, we, uh, uh, as I as I reported in my in my statement, uh, my impression was that. Uh, uh, objection at this point, it, it, it's improper for him to read from the statement. If he has a problem with his memory, he can refresh it. Thank you. Just no your objection. Sorry, Your Honor. Council. If you need to refer to your okay. report to remember something, just let us know. We'll have mm -hmm. you do that and then put the report back. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. And, and I just want to, uh, do you testify often as part of your nature of your job? No, this is the second time. Okay. Are you a little nervous? A little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, so take me through your contact with the defendant, and if you don't remember, mm -hmm. we, can, we can look at your report. Uh, so, so initially the, the defendant presented as lethargic and confused. Um, but I, I did not see any obvious injuries on him to, to indicate that that was consistent with the way he was presenting. Um, as, I, as I mentioned in my statement, uh, we uh, applied a little, little stimulus and he then answered clearly that um, I believe he said he last saw his wife in the garage. You said a couple of things there I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. When you said that you applied stimulus, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Uh, we raised our voices, and I believe uh, the way I did it was uh, squeezed his arm and his shoulder. Okay. And after that, the defendant was able to clearly answer you? Yes. Okay. Have you ever treated somebody who's, who's been in a fire before? Uh, three or four. Okay. And was this confusion and lethargy something that you were expecting? It, it could be possible. Um, it didn't seem to match when, when I evaluated him under the light of the medic in it. Okay. And talk to us about that, about, about treating him in the back of the well, medic unit. So, so then we, we then moved him to the back of the medic unit on the gurney. And, and how did you do that? By gurney. Okay. We put him on the gurney and, and wheeled him there. Um, my partner was setting up in, in the back of, of the rig uh, waiting to receive a patient. So he was doing things such as getting out the, the heart monitor, hanging IV bags. Um, so I arrived. We then were able to start uh, evaluating. Um, I did not see uh, any burns. I did not see what looked like any soot or, or uh, discoloration of his airway, uh, but he was still presenting to us as, as confused or lethargic. Why were you looking for burns? Just any area that may need to be treated. Okay. And what is the significance of, of soot and discoloration of an airway, as you said? So we're checking the airway to see if there's any possibility for further complications. Uh, a lot of times if you've inhaled um, heated gases and air, you can get further swelling of the airway. And so soot, burns, things of that nature would indicate that maybe we need to get ahead of the curve and take control of his airway through innovation. Have you ever heard of the term smoke inhalation? Yes. What is smoke inhalation? Simply breathing in toxic fumes, gases, secondary uh -huh. to a fire. And what are things you expect to see uh, in treating somebody for a smoke inhalation? Well, physical signs. I'd, I'd expect to see some discoloration around their lips, maybe in their upper airway. Uh, depending on how, how close they were to the source as well. Okay. And did you see any of those things on the defendant? I did not.
was the defendant in need of any kind of care from you as, as, a, as your role as a paramedic? Uh, I was not with him long enough to determine if he did not need any care. Uh, that's, that's actually up for the, to, for the hospital to decide. Okay. Uh, our plan initially was we were going we to start two IVs and take control of his airway and transport him down to Harbor Gate just out of precaution and and we don't know exactly what he was exposed to in the in the home. And why Harbor View? Uh, because that's best trauma center around. They're they're equipped to take care of those type of injuries. What and you said you were gonna do IVs as well? Yes. What did you do with the defendant? Uh, we then got radio traffic again from Lieutenant Putz saying that he had a more severely injured patient. Uh, up at the scene, we needed to come forward and, and get that patient and transfer the patient we had, I believe, to Medic 10, to one of the district paramedic units. Okay. And when you say we, who is your partner? Myself that? and uh, paramedic Josh Peterson. Were you comfortable passing off the defendant to another medic unit? Yes. Did you see anything exhibited by the defendant that uh, would have necessitated his immediate transport away from the scene? No. Who else did you treat that night? I treated Brenda Welch. And did this person, uh, Ms. Welch, actually require your treatment skills? Yes. Where did you find her? Uh, pretty close to the same location where I initially was in contact with the first patient, uh, near the front bumper of Engine 14. So she had already been taken out of the house? Yes, she had been brought out of the house. Could you tell the extent of her injuries? Uh, not the extent initially, because the light was poor, um, but, but I could tell that she was severely hurt. And. Was she sitting up, laying down? No, she was laying down. Um, she was she was burnt. There was uh, a lot of blood, and she actually was uh, presenting with agonal respirations I'm at that sorry, time. Agonal, A G O N A L. Thank you. You said that she was very bloody. Mm-hmm. Is, is that a yes? Yes, I'm sorry. Were you able to tell where she was bleeding from? Could you tell a specific injury? Uh, not, not initially. So, so initially when I arrived, um, she was on the ground. One of the, the fire district one paramedics had established IV access at that point. Um, and I think they were assisting her, her ventilations with a bag valve mask. And then... What is that? A bag valve mask. So essentially a... Uh, it's a mask with a, a reservoir bag attached to it so we can breathe for a patient who's not breathing for themselves without having to actually put our mouth there. And you were talking about agonal. Describe that for us. Um, essentially, agonal respirations look like a fish out of water. Um, the, mouth, the mouth is moving, but you have no tidal volume. You're not, you're not moving air. Is this something that requires immediate care? Yes. So what did, what were you able to do? So initially her ventilations were being, she was being ventilated with the bag valve mask. Um, an IV was established. We then put her on the gurney, brought her to the back of Medic 15, um, where we could get a, a better look at her condition under the lights. Um, from there, um, we I'm not sure if initially we got a second IV at that point, but uh, at that point we knew that we needed to to uh, perform an endotracheal intubation uh, so that we could breathe for her. Um, she was essentially covered uh, with blood and she had burns. There was uh, a lot of blood coming from the back of her head and blood coming from inside her right ear, which led me to believe that uh, she had a skull fracture. And uh, so we used uh, some medications to 
make sure that she was unconscious and then paralyzed. And then we went in and performed the intubation. Um, so we were able to breathe for her. We then gave her some more medications um, to treat uh, pain and also try to, try to keep her from essentially remembering the event and to keep her from, you know, fighting the, the tube. It was pretty uncomfortable. I think we probably all know what intubation is, but could mm -hmm. you just describe that for the jury, please? Yes, so, so we'll go into the airway with the uh, orange scope and uh, we're trying to visualize essentially the vocal cords and, uh, and, the, and we're going to pass the tube through the vocal cords down into the trachea and, uh, and we're going to use that to ventilate our patient. And this required quite a bit, quite an amount of medication in order to do that as well as to treat her? Uh, so we, uh, I believe initially we gave her 20 milligrams of etomidate which would render her unconscious. And you have an anonymous spell accommodate for the short court? Uh, yes. <laughs> I like it, don't spell it wrong. Uh, E-T-O-M-I-D-A-T-E. -E. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then uh, uh, we also gave her, I believe, 150 milligrams of succinylcholine, which would paralyze her. Anectine, A-N-E-C-T-I-N-E, -E, another name for it. Okay. You indicated that you transported Ms. Morgan to the back of you, the medic. Mm -hmm. Did you notice anything unusual about her? Um, once we got to the back of the medic again? Yes, sir. Um, not other than the extent of her injuries. I, I thought that it was... So I, I thought that it was odd that she had both these burns uh, and a skull fracture, um, so much so that after we um, got to Harborview and transferred care of the patient, that I then called back to the scene uh, to notify the the uh, chief and the MSO that that something seemed out of place. Do you typically call back to a scene and say something seems strange? No. Do you recall ever doing it before? No. People that are in a fire, um, do they sometimes smell like smoke? Yes. Could you smell smoke on Ms. Morgan? Uh, I, I imagine so, but uh, not not over the, the smell of gasoline. So describe that for me, please. Um, she smelled as if gasoline had been poured directly on her. Do you have any personal experience with starting a fire using gasoline? Objection to the relevance. Uh, when doing land clearing. Okay. Uh, is it typical for you to smell like gasoline in, in the same manner as when you do it? Uh, not, not once the fire started. Usually most of it burns off, but uh, there was still just an incredibly strong odor of what I believe to be gasoline coming off of the, the victim. Could you tell where it was originating from? Not exactly. Was that something that you were expecting? No. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the reason that you called back to the scene? Objection. This is <coughs> You indicated that something didn't seem right, correct? Yes. Why did you do that? Uh, because of the strong smell of gasoline and <clears throat> the extensive trauma that she had suffered um, in addition to the burns. Where was she transported? Harborview Medical Center. And I think that you've already sort of touched on this, but why that hospital? 
So it, it's the only level one trauma center in the state. And they actually receive trauma patients from three different states. So. So they also specifically have a, a burn ward. And, and you indicated that the victim had burns on her? Uh, second, possibly third degree. It's hard to tell at that time uh, from the chest up. And why was it hard to tell? Uh, because burns will kind of develop over time, but they were at least second degree because skin was, was sloughing off. And uh, so uh, sloughing skin, blisters, um, some of it may have been, been blackened as well. Um, it, it was hard to tell also with the blood and, and the soot from the fire that everything becomes matted and entangled. We talked about smoke inhalation mm -hmm. before. Was the, the victim suffering from smoke inhalation? Uh, what I saw was that she had um, what I believe was uh, blackened, thick blood in the back of her airway. Uh, it, it, it's hard to tell if it was blood or all soot, but with with the injuries I was seeing, uh, educated guess that it was, it was a combination of blood and soot. And so the, those are things you saw in the victim, but not on the defendant, correct? Correct. After arriving at Harborview and then calling back to the scene, uh, what was your involvement in this? At, after that time, we put our, put our medic unit back in service. Uh, we returned uh, actually to Fire Station 15 to pick up some additional personnel and then returned back to the scene, um, dropped those personnel off, and then we went to Fire Station 15 and that's when I wrote my report. Did you have any other contact with the defendant that evening other than when you first were with him? No. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you, cross examination. Thank you. The exhibit that you have mm -hmm. states Exhibit number 40, those are, that's actually two separate documents, is it not? Yes. And can you tell us how each of those documents came to be prepared and when you prepared them? So the first document, or the document on top, is my statement that I wrote when I returned back to the fire station after shuttling personnel. And was that part of a or attached to a Linwood Police Department incident statement form? Uh, this was my statement. Right, but done as a Police Department incident statement? Yes. Okay. Now the other document, what was mm -hmm. that prepared? So the other document is my medical report, and so it uh, it's a fluid document during, during the call that, that uh, documents our treatments, uh, the conditions in which we found the patient. Um, it, it's actually an evolving document uh, as the call goes on. A lot, of, a lot of the vital signs on here are downloaded from our life back, our heart monitor, okay. um, at, at the hospital. Okay. And does that involve your, your treatment of both of the individuals at the scene? No, this is uh, just Brenda Welch. Okay. Now, did you in fact um, provide treatment to Mr. Morgan at the scene and take information such as his uh, oxygen rate. Um, yes, I believe that was one of the vital signs we had before we so, transferred care to the other paramedic unit. Did you simply not document that, or is there some other document that you have that documented the... The other paramedic unit would have the documentation on his treatment and care. So the work you've done would be transferred to them or just disregarded? I believe it should be contained in their report. But 
one of the things you did, you checked his his oxygen, his yes. O2 saturation, mm -hmm. correct? And that was uh, what would be at the extremely low, or at the low level for normal, uh, potentially indicating uh, um, smoke inhalation, correct? Uh, it was documented as, uh, I believe, 94, 95 percent would be the the low end of normal. Um, it it could be normal for him if. He has some sort of respiratory history, such as COPD, or he's a smoker. Or it could indicate uh, exposure to smoke. Potentially. If he doesn't have COPD or uh, is a chronic smoker, correct? Potentially. Okay. And do you have any information that would indicate that the person you were seeing had COPD or was a chronic smoker? No. Okay. Um, so, although his airway appeared to you to be clear of soot, the oxygen saturation that you took indicated a potential for uh, exposure to smoke, correct? If I have a patient with an oxygen saturation of 95%, that does not mean I'm necessarily even applying supplemental oxygen. Okay. Was he given oxygen at the scene? Not by me. But you weren't uh, particularly involved in his care as you were called off to assist with Ms. Welch, correct? Correct. I had him briefly. And um, were you aware at all, personally, as to whether uh, subsequent paramedics provided him with oxygen, supplemental oxygen there at the scene? No, I do not know what their care was. Okay. And um, now you mentioned some strong odor of alcohol about Ms. Welch. There was no such odor about... I did not say alcohol. I said uh, gasoline. I'm sorry. No odor of... There was a strong odor of gasoline about Ms. Welch, correct? Gasoline, yes. Okay. No such order about Mr. Moore. Correct? Not that I noticed. Okay. And certainly, as a firefighter, if you had noticed a strong odor of gasoline, you would have documented it, wouldn't you? Yes. Because okay. you documented it with regard to Ms. Welch, mm -hmm. but not with Mr. Morgan, correct? Uh, correct. Mr. Okay. Morgan was briefly under my care but we have one patient care record that goes with the patient. And so he was treated by fire district one paramedics. Okay, but in your statement for the police, if you had noticed the smell of gasoline about his person or clothing, you would have noted that for the report you wrote that night for the Linwood police, correct? Yes, I would put that in my statement. Now, you did note that he appeared to be confused and lethargic uh, mm -hmm. in his interaction with Lieutenant Putz, correct? Yes. And you indicated that could uh, potentially have some connection with smoke inhalation. Have you dealt with individuals who've been concussed, who suffered head injury? Yes. And that lethargy and confusion are uh, also uh, circumstances uh, that can be related to head injury, correct? They could be, yes. Okay. Now, were you aware that at the time you contacted him, he had already indicated to Lieutenant Putz that he believed someone was in the garage and it turned over a garage door opener? Could you restate the question? Were you aware at the time when you made contact with him and Lieutenant Putz. Your Honor, I'm going to object. He's assuming facts on the evidence. He's testifying about something that has not been testified to. Let me have you rephrase that question, please. When you contacted mm -hmm. Mr. Morton, he was in communication with Lieutenant Putz, correct? Yes, he was in, in contact with Lieutenant Putz. Okay. And Lieutenant you, Putz was trying to communicate with him. And, and did you speak to Lieutenant Putz about his prior interaction with Mr. Morton? No. So you weren't aware of any conversation they may have had previous? No. And During the interaction with Lieutenant Putz, he appeared lethargic and confused, correct? Yes. And that, that presentation 
can be the result of either a smoke inhalation or concussion, correct? It could be. But he answered clearly once we asked the question again. Okay. Now, as far as clear answers, mm -hmm. you said that his response was that he saw his wife in the garage? Is that what you testified to today? So, I don't remember what the exact words were, but he alluded to a female May, or he last saw her in the garage. He connected those two things. All right, the but I want to be, and the garage. I want to be clear that what you testified to, this statement of seeing mm -hmm. his wife in the garage, that's your words, not his, right? That that's how I remember the incident. <clears throat> Your partner attempted to lay him flat on the ground in order to provide care, correct? I don't know that for certain. And he was asked, the person was asked if there was anyone else in the home, correct? Yes, I remember Lieutenant Putz asking that. And he indicated that he thought Brenda, his wife, was in the home, isn't that correct? I don't know if he used her name at that time. And, and at that point, the question became, where in the house? And he had indicated that maybe in the garage. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> might just have one moment. Prior to passing the defendant off to the other medic unit, mm -hmm. yes. I realize your interaction was brief, but if you thought the defendant needed oxygen, would you have provided that? Yes. As far as his O2 saturations being down, um, can can weather affect that? Not specifically weather. Well. If it's cold outside, um, you can become peripherally constricted. Uh, your, your blood vessels will, will constrict and decrease flow to, to your extremities. Well, that's where our monitor goes, is on the finger. And so it, it can give a falsely low reading. Okay. Uh, do you recall how cold it was there in November? I do not. Okay. Do you recall it being overly warm? No. Mr. Wackerman talked about a concussion being a symptom of uh, being confused and lethargic. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, is a concussion something that you would look for in treating somebody that's come from a fire? It, it wouldn't be on my primary differential. Um, it wouldn't be one of the first things I'd be looking for. Um, what about if somebody's presenting as confused and lethargic, though? Uh, yes, down down the road. Um, initially, I would be thinking smoke inhalation. Okay. Um, there was no sign of smoke inhalation. Not that I saw. Objection. He's actually testified that the low oxygen <clears throat> saturation is consistent with smoke inhalation. Oh. Did you see any other signs other than the low 
oxygen saturation that indicated smoke inhalation? No. Was there any soot? No. Was his airway uh, constricted? No. Was there any symptom other than the slow saturation that indicated smoke inhalation? No. What about for a concussion? Any injuries consistent with a concussion? At this point, Your Honor, I don't believe we have a foundation for this officer testifying about uh, as I stated, my, my time with uh, Mr. Morgan was brief. Uh, I don't remember examining his head at that point. Uh, Had he been injured in the head, is that something that you would have noted? If, if I had noticed it. Was there anything that you've noted in your report as you've earlier reviewed it that indicates an injury consistent with a concussion? I did not see any injuries consistent with a concussion. Did you see any injuries? Negative. No. And I forgot, who was your partner? Josh Peterson. Josh Peterson. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. No further. Is it your testimony that concussion requires some physical manifestation, outward signs? No, I'm not saying that it has to. I'm saying that I saw no outward physical sign. You also said you didn't examine for a concussion given the brief time that you were with him. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay. So it's not surprising that you didn't see sign of concussion when you didn't examine him for a concussion, correct? I did not see any obvious injury. No other questions. Thank you. Nothing further for. No, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Step down. Thank you. Excuse me. Should I leave a statement here? Uh, I'll get it. I'll get it. Okay. S-O-N. Mr. Anderson, you uh, married? Yes. How many years? 51, 52. Yeah. What's your uh, anniversary date? November 16th. Do you know, you have a son named Chris? Yes. And um, where's Chris? Well, back uh, 15 months ago on your anniversary on uh, 19, uh, on 2014, where was Chris living? in Lake Stevens. And do you know a woman named Brenda Welsh? Yes. And how do you know Brenda? Brenda lived with Chris. Did you spend, you and your wife, uh, spend time over at uh, your son's house and Brenda's house? Yes. On a regular basis? Fairly regular. Would, um, were you, did you know a little Kylie? Yes. And you uh, spent some time with Kylie? Yes. Did you know what, generally, where Kylie would go on weekends? Yes, she went to her father's place. Okay. And as a part of being involved in their lives and going over to the house on Sunday, did you, did you, were you aware of a pattern as to when Brenda would leave, if she would leave, on yes. Sunday nights? Yes. And what was that? She'd leave. 6.25, 6.30 to go to Linwood. For what purpose? To pick up Kylie. Did you spend your 51st anniversary with your wife over at your son's house? Yes. And were you there when Brenda 
uh, left to pick Kylie up. Yes. You see her, see her leave? Yes. And later that night, did you become aware that something had happened? Yes. Uh, did you get some phone calls or whatnot? Got a phone call. Did you know then, and do you remember now, what time it was that Brenda left Lake Stevens headed for uh, Linwood? 6.25. P.M. P.M. That's all I wanted to ask you, sir. Thank you. Cross-examination. Your Honor, no cross. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Campbell, if you get settled, if you could state your name, spelling your first and your last name for the record, please. Uh, Aaron Campbell, A-A-R-O-N-C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. Okay. And where are you currently living, sir? Uh, 6216 Parkway, Linwood, Washington, 90036. 90036. So she's writing down everything you're saying, so I need you to talk a little bit slower. Uh, how long have you lived there? Um, on and off for... Uh, 15 years or so. Okay. Uh, there is an exhibit that's been admitted here over your shoulder that states Exhibit 37. Uh, the neighborhood. Are, are you? Do you happen to be able to see your house on that that map? Uh, you can stand up and look. And you've been living off and on for about 15 years mm -hmm. at this house right here? I believe that's the one. It's hard to tell because we have to go around the block. Oh. I'm sorry, because what? I'd have to go around the block to see, but we have a big back deck. So. Were you home on November 16th, 2014? I believe so. Okay. Yes. Do you recall a fire happening? If that's the same date, correct? Yes. Okay. And are you? Do you know your neighbors? Are you? Are you friendly with your neighbors at all? Behind us, no. Okay. Uh -huh. Had you ever interacted with the people that lived in the house that was on fire? No. How did you become aware that there was a fire? Neighbors across the street actually saw the flames. Came over, pounded on our door, and that's when we happened to. Look out back and see it. Okay. And what did you do uh, upon seeing the fire? Uh, it was quite shocking. <laughs> so uh, initially, 
I pretty much freaked out. You know? um, first initial reaction was to do something to protect our house because the flames were really high and was thinking the trees might catch on fire, so looking for a water source. Mm -hmm. um, and then soon after hearing um, the uh, fire trucks realized that they were close. So then, knowing they'd be there any second, my next reaction was to just grab my phone and take video. And did you, in fact, take video of the fire? Yes. And have you had a chance to review the video uh, which is contained on the disc, which is State's Exhibit number 39? Did you previously look at that? Yes. Is it, in fact, the video that you took that night? Yes. Uh, does it appear to have been altered, changed in any way? No. Is it true and accurate copy of the video you took that night? Yes. You know, the state moved to admit State's Exhibit number 39. Any objections? No objections. Exhibit 39 would be approved. Thank you. Is there other one? Yeah, we can just test it and see which is best. Fantastic. Okay. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Mr. Campbell, I'm going to play a video here. How many videos did you actually take? Do you recall? Um, two. <coughs> and you indicated that you could hear the fire engines while you were doing this? Yes. Play the first video here. Where are you standing when you're taking this video? This is initially from the back deck. Close to the house. Of your house? Yes. Okay. So is this house, this house is behind yours? Correct. Prior to hearing or, or having your neighbor knock on the door, were you at all aware that this was going on? No, we were on the other side of the house. There's the... Our house. Okay. Yeah. And after you came outside, you indicated you heard the fire engines. Could you hear any smoke detectors? No. Did you hear any when you were in your, inside your house? No. Who is this who you're talking to? That's my... My mother. Could you feel the heat from the flames? Oh, yeah. Describe that for me. Intense. Very intense. Have you ever felt anything like that before? Um, maybe right when you open up the oven <laughs> to pull food out. It looks like the angle has shifted here. Where are you now? Now I'm in the corner of our lot, back corner of our yard, um, up on a ladder, just uh, overlooking the shared fence. Could you see any fire happening on the other parts of the house? Or were you keeping the camera sort of centered on work? Focused on the side, only one side of the house was on fire that I visually saw.
by the time you got outside, was this this portion of the house we're seeing already engulfed? Yes. And as you're filming this, can you see firefighters? Oh yes, that's them there. about halfway through the video when of course technology stops. Uh, did you have any other interaction with this home that night? No. And did you turn over your videos to the police? Yes. Did you ever see the defendant that night? No. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Mr. Campbell, when this fire started, you indicated you were in the front of your house. Is that right? Front portion inside the house. Right. The front portion of your house, which is farther away from the house, which is on fire. Correct. And so you weren't aware that it was on fire until your neighbors came over and alerted you. Correct. So you weren't outside um, seeing anything that might have happened prior to when the flames became obvious. Correct. And you indicated that when you first noticed the fire itself, um, you were certainly concerned about your own property. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, and fairly so. Yeah. Um, and but it, within a very short amount of time, you heard fire engines coming. Is that right? Would you characterize it that way? Correct. By the time I got outside, correct. Okay. Um, and then. Um, Moments later, that's when you shot the first video that we just watched. Correct. Okay. And so within that time frame when you came out and, and saw what was going on and started shooting the your your camera, a very short amount of time had passed, right? I'm sorry, say that again. So from the moment that you came outside to first observe what was going on until we you started shooting that first video that we just watched, a very short amount of time had passed. Relatively. Okay. And during that time, you didn't observe anybody in the backyard? No. Okay. Um, where you were from your deck, though, your view, would you agree your view was obstructed? Somewhat. Okay. Um, you couldn't see directly in the, the backyard behind you, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you have no further questions? Do you ever recall about what time this was? As I recall, we were watching Sunday Night Football. So it was around halftime, maybe 7-ish, around the 7 o'clock hour. Perfect. No further questions, Mr. Campbell, thank you. Anything additional from the defense? No, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Excuse me.
Your Honor, the state calls Jason Turner to the stand. State your name, spell your first and your last name for the record, please. My name is Jason Stewart Turner, J A S O N T U R N E R. And where are you currently employed? I work for the City of Linwood Fire Department. And how long have you worked there? Uh, approximately 16 years. Okay. And any previous experience prior to Linwood? Yes, I worked for the City of Mount Lake Terrace Fire Department for about seven years. And what is your role within the Linwood Fire Department? Uh, currently, my position is a rank of official rank of captain with on sea shift with the City of Linwood Fire Department, and I am currently assigned the sea shift battalion chief in charge of operations on sea shift. Okay, so what do those two things mean, being the captain and being the battalion chief? I'm in charge. Fair enough. <laughs> it's the easiest way. You like easy. Can you go through your, your training uh, that you had to receive in order to become where you are today? Um, actually, every day is a training day, but approximately um, for the last 22 plus years, been trained in every aspect of fire suppression and um, rescue, extrication, vehicle, everything. And what you do, I uh, got my degree in uh, fire administration, um, and part of that is uh, command and control, operations, training. There's, the list is literally 22 years of training. And can you estimate in the course of your, your long career how many fires you've responded to? Hundreds. When you're first responding to a fire, what are you trained to do? What, I mean, the house on fire, what do you do? Um, it's a hard thing. Uh, a lot of people, I think, see the movies, uh, Chicago Fire, the TV show, uh, Rescue 42. It's absolutely nothing like that at all. Um, so we look at, we kind of break it down in the most simplistic form. A house is a box. It's a box with little boxes inside it. Some of those boxes are on fire and we go put them out. Um, so we look at a home or an incident and break it down to its simplest component and uh, just kind of attack each little issue or component and try to solve those problems and pretty soon the incident goes away or the fire goes away. And, so in particular, like a house fire, we would just look at that as a box. If it's a single-story box, it's a single-story residence. If it's two-story, it's a two-story box. Uh, where's the fire at? Is where we put our hose lines, it's basically. You're doing it She's going to tell you to slow down. Well, actually, she just told me to tell you to slow down. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Still. That's okay. um, do, you, do you testify often as part of your job? I actually, no, this is only, most of the time, I've only given two other depositions, and this is my first time testifying, so okay. I apologize. So. Um, we got lots of time. I just need you to slow down a little bit. So you're talking about uh, this being a box, and you need to you need to kind of figure out what to do. So go ahead. So a box for like a residence, uh, you would look at that and try to determine where the fire or the incident or the problem is occurring within the box, and that you then make your your judge your actions or where you would put your personnel or where I would direct my personnel um, based on where that incident is within the box. So. We look at a house four-sided. Um, some people look at them six-sided, depends. Um, but it's Alpha would be the front, Bravo, Charlie, Delta is how we look at a kind of a geographic orientation of the structure. Uh, floor one, floor two, anything below that would be floor like zero one, zero two. So basement levels would go corresponding with a zero in front of them. So we look at that kind of tactically, simply as boxes, shoe boxes stacked on top of shoe boxes in essence. Is this training um, fairly across the board for most firefighters? The incident management system is what we use. It's a national system. Um, it's how we do the command and control component for all emergency incidents, big or small. It's a, it's a system that's developed to expand or contract given the size of the incident. So a small incident, we may not use all facets of the incident command structure. Larger incidents, we would use like a mass casualty incident in an active shooter situation at a mall would be a very large incident command structure. So it's uh, it's how we organize our resources so we can track and manage people safely. And so if you were to 
be plugged into another unit, um, would how would it be easy for you to be able to fight a fire with these people you've never worked before because you're using the same system? Yes, we all have our own. Each department has its own identity, uh, way of doing business, uh, standard operating procedures, guidelines that are unique into that jurisdiction. However, under that incident command role, and you're talking about yes. I mean, the answer would be directly yes. Uh, we would all work together in a common function, in a common aspect that's uniform across the board. The only different would be our flair, our d different operating or guidelines. Like someone might have used different equipment than we would to accomplish the same task. But, but yes, the answer would be yes. And you're a firefighter using the term flair. Well, a flair, I mean, is some people have, uh, yes, um, our uniforms might be slightly different, hats might be different, that kind of thing. I understand. Our style. Did you respond to a house fire on November 16, 2014? I did. And do you have a, an independent recollection of this? I do. Have you also had an opportunity to read your written statement? I have, sir. How did you end up getting called out to the scene that evening? Uh, it was dispatched. It came in as a house fire, residential fire. Um, my station, station 15, at the time I was on the engine, um, engine 15, we were the second new engine to that fire. It was the, the city is broken into geographic areas. Uh, station 14 covers one half, station 15 covers the other half. Uh, the fire came in on 14 side of town, so uh, station 14 side of town, so we would have been the second engine to arrive at the fire. Why is it that multiple stations would have responded to the same fire if it's in their geographical location? Uh, personnel. We need a lot of people to put out a house fire. Um, in particular, we always, <clears throat> we always try to think the worst, prepare for the worst, and so we send maybe maybe slightly more than what we need, but if the incident grows or is larger, then we're slightly, then we're prepared, we're ahead of the curve. So that's why we send so many resources. And how quickly did you arrive to the scene? Within a few minutes of dispatch. And you were, uh, where in the line of engines were you? So engine 14 uh, was uh, in charge, of, uh, Captain John Putz was in charge of that engine. They arrived on first, uh, gave a short report, we were the second due engine, so we were considered the supply engine. So what we do is we take the fire hydrant, we then lay supply hose to this, the first arriving engine. Typically in that role, we make that connection. I would typically assume command of the incident while the first due engine goes straight to work. Um, however, there's some other stuff that happened that didn't, that didn't transpire. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, describe what you mean by hooking, finding the fire hydrant, the supply line, all that. So as the second in engine, um, we only have 500 gallons in our fire engines. Um, that's about two minutes of water. That's not nearly enough for a well-involved structure. Uh, so we always take a hydrant. Uh, so we have about 1,000 feet of supply hose. Uh, my job as a second due officer is to identify the closest to hydrant and make that water supply connection for the first due engine, thereby securing an indefinite amount of water. And, uh, and then also supplying manpower typically to do backup or be there in case something for rescue, firefighter protection, etc. That's what you would typically do? Yes. Did you do that this night? Part of it. Okay. What part did you do? We laid the supply. We took the hydrant, I dropped off, uh, directed my driver to stop at the intersection of like 193rd and 64, um, which was across the street, requested uh, police department to block the road so nobody would drive over a supply hose. Um, we then laid about three or four hundred feet on the ground to the first two engine. I directed my driver, firefighter Scott Russell, to make the connection from our supply hose to the attack fire engine, the first two engine, that was engine 14. I then exited my cab and reported to uh, Captain John Putz. And have you worked with him before? I have. And what was going on uh, when you finally arrived at the house? Well, as we were driving down the road, I noticed uh, Captain Putz was in the front yard of the residence. I could see a lot of fire. I couldn't tell exactly where the fire was. It just lit up the sky. I could see every home around it. Um, and I could see Captain John Putz uh, dealing with an individual in the front yard. 
um, and we were driving down the front row and I was looking at that, but as we get closer, my view gets cut off by the fire engine in front of me, so I couldn't see that anymore. So that's when I exited the vehicle, told my crew, and went to the front, and assuming I was going to take command of the incident, um, then I met him and he directed me to do fire suppression instead. Where was uh, Lieutenant Putz when he was contacting this person you saw? You know, if, if I'm driving down the driveway or, in, or the road and I'm looking, it was kind of more to the latter third of the driveway, I guess, so close to the sidewalk, which I don't think that neighborhood doesn't really have sidewalks, but towards the street. Okay. It would be on the driver's side of his fire engine. And what was that person who John Putz was with, has been identified as the defendant, uh, what was he doing? Uh, it appeared to me initially, my initial reaction was, great, we're dealing with an intoxicated male okay. um, because of his, the stumbling and the stuff that was going on. And could you hear any conversation that was going on between him? And... No, I was in the cab of the fire engine at that point. It wasn't until I actually made face-to-face -face communications with uh, Putz that I was able to hear kind of what was going on. And did you end up making contact with the defendant? I did, sir. And how did that happen? Um, when I went to uh, Captain Potts, I said, uh, you want me to, I asked him, I said, you want me to take command? And he says, I can't, I got this and I got that. And he pointed to the defendant and, um, and I, I remember he goes, I got to deal with that or something to that effect. And I looked and the defendant was kind of stumbling around and like I said, acting, what I thought initially was intoxicated. Um, and so I, I looked at that and he says, I got to deal with that. Can you get a line? And I went, absolutely. What he meant, referred to grab a hose line and go fight fire. Okay. So what did you do? Um, well, he directed the uh, defendant to the front of the fire engine. He said, go over there or something like that. I, I don't remember exactly. And I kind of walked with him and the defendant and I was like, I remember going, what's wrong with you? And I'm looking at him like, was there looking at him like, yeah, are you hurt? Are you burned? What, you know, and I just remember thinking, and so I walked him, and then he kind of laid down in front of the front of the fire engine, and I was like, "Okay, whatever." I went and grabbed the hose. Okay. Did you have to hold up the defendant walking him to the front of the engine? No, sir. Uh, could you see any injuries to him whatsoever? No, sir. Could you see anything to explain what you were seeing? No, and that's why I was like, "What are you doing?" You indicated that after you laid down, you went to go fight the fire. Mm -hmm. Had there been injuries that required attention, is that something you would have done, is just to leave him there? No, absolutely not. It's incident priorities are people. What do you mean by that? That's the first thing we do. Rescue, patient care. If a building can burn to the ground, people are not replaceable. Buildings are. Was there anything you saw that night that required your attention as far as it goes with Mr. Morgan? Not that I saw initially at the front of the fire engine. In fact, that's what I thought he was. Remember that I, I remember thinking or saying, like, why are you acting this way? Like, what, what's going on? And was the defendant saying anything? Uh, he wasn't saying anything. He was moaning. What do you mean? <laughs> he pointed and went, uh, like, and I was like, what? And he did it like three times and pointed and kind of had a, like, uh, I mean, it was, it seriously, it, like I said, it struck me as very odd. I, mean, I don't know how to act it out. It was just, it struck me as very, very odd. Did he say anything else? No, sir. Was this in response to any kind of questions from you? Yeah, I was like, what's going on? Or when I was at him and he was, when I initially made con when I initially made contact and Captain Putz kind of directed him to the front of the engine and I was kind of walking with him and when he was doing that as he was kind of laying down in front of the fire engine um, he was doing that and I remember it was like what's going on what are you doing that or whatever I, I don't know exactly what I said but it was something to that effect. Do you have training in trying to assess injuries for people that have been in a fire? Yes, sir. And uh, were you able to assess any injuries on the defendant? 
Uh, my visual, I didn't, like I said, I did not have any physical contact with the defendant. Um, my initial assessment was that's what I was looking for, uh, was what's adding up here, what's, and initially, like I said, it's either he's intoxicated or something, but that's not something that I would need to stop what I'm doing and direct. He had no, no obvious medical need at that time. What is your role now that it's time to respond to the fire? Um, I was initially uh, Lieutenant or Captain Butts. I'm, I'm sorry, Lieutenant and Captain is, uh, we just had our rank changed from Lieutenant to Captain. So if I'm referring to Captain or Lieutenant, it's the same. I'm, I apologize. Um, uh, Lieutenant Potts had directed me to pull an inch and three-quarter line, like uh, our standard kind of operating or tactical approach to a building or a box on fire would you go from Alpha to Charlie or from front to back. Uh, so I pulled an inch and three-quarter pre-connect off of the... You know. <laughs> okay, again, I'm sorry. I heard an inch and a quarter pre-connect. What, what is that? An inch three. It's the diameter of the fire attack line that we use typically for residential fires. Okay, and any reason that you would use that particular... It's more maneuverable. It's uh, standard. Uh, typically, judging by the size of a fire, we can judge the type of hose line we would need. Uh, the next size up would be a two and a half inch hand line, which should be very difficult inside a residence to move around. So you need to be able to move around inside? Yes, it's very difficult. Uh, there's approximately 150 PSI to 170 PSI in a 200 foot length of inch and three quarter line. Basically it's like bending a piece of rebar around the corners inside a home to get it back to a back bedroom and open it up and, and use water inside the hose under pressure to put the fire out. Okay. So that's why we use that size of line. And explain what's going on through your mind when you walk up to this fire. It's now time to fight the fire. So. As I said earlier, there's kind of a standard approach that we look at a house, uh, try to break it down into a sim simple components. Okay, where's the fire at? Uh, you just look at it tactically. You know, what are the smoke conditions? What are the fire conditions? Uh, how much is on fire? Um, during that transition from pulling the inch and three quarter line to the front of the house, a gentleman, a, a resident, or a neighbor. Uh, had said there might be a young girl inside the house, so that kind of sped up our actions as far as what we're going to do. So I didn't, uh, you know, take my time. We always say hurry up and walk um, or hurry up and slow down. It's kind of slow is fast, fast is slow. Uh, we want to be very deliberate and methodical on a fire ground, so that kind of went to the wayside when there was a potential rescue. Um, so. I grabbed the inch and three quarter line and ran very quickly with it to the front door of the residence. Um, before I got there, I tripped over uh, these little hoop things. Um, they were decorative green hoops that you couldn't see in the middle of the night, and about five of us all fell on our face at one point or another during the evening, okay. catching our feet. These, uh, like for a garden? Or? Yeah, they almost look like little, what are this, a little thing, a little ball that you hit with a ball in the front here? No, uh, crochet? Croquet. Okay. <laughs> Croquet, yeah, that, it's, I don't know if they were decorative or what, but they were dark color and green and there were several of them in the front yard, which caused me to ungraciously fall on my face with a bundle of hose on the front. But we were, I was able to get it deployed, called for water, um, and uh, forced the front entry door open to the residents. So talk to us about, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. Did, did anything seem unusual to you about the fire yet? So there is a, yes, uh, like I said, looking at the, the house as you approach it, you try to try to look at it very simply um, and look at it, like I said, tactically. Um, the fire was on the back side of the home. We always try to go from the unburned side of the home to the burned side of the home. What we don't want to do is push heat, smoke, hot gases, those kind of things in unburned areas where there might be potential occupants or survivors. So. I was approaching or going to go from the Alpha to Charlie in the event to push the fire out the back side of the home. And does putting water on a fire actually... Objection at this point is, is unresponsive to the question as to whether there was anything oh, unusual. Oh, 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 oh. Um, so when I went to the front of the home and I opened the front door, that volume of fire that I could see on the back side of the home was impressive from the front. 
Um, I could see that it had a weird construction feature like a double roof type of a thing. It was like a, an addition or something on the back side of the home. Um, and the amount of fire that was on the back of the home didn't transpose to the front of the home. And so when I opened the front entry, I, I, there was very little smoke. It looked like the front entry light was on and there was no heat associated with that. Typically, I would open up a front door to a home that's on fire. It would be black smoke to the ground, pressurized, tremendous amount of heat, none of that. Um, so that struck me as like, what? Almost as if the home wasn't on fire. And based on your training experience and all the fires you responded to, did you have an explanation for why that could be? No, I, I was thinking, is there an internal partition? Is this somehow a door that would block the rest of the residents off or something that was stopping that fire uh, from coming to where I was at? Because, when, like I said, when I opened the front door, it was like the lights was on, there was very little smoke, there was no heat, and it didn't. Tr the front did not equate to the back. Okay. Uh, how did you make entry into the home? Uh, initially, while um, I was waiting for my crew to come back me up, uh, we don't typically enter a home unless we're in pairs of two. We always operate on a fire ground in pairs of two in case one of us gets injured. Uh, we can affect rescue or at least uh, help get other people there. Um, but because, like I said, the pressure of the fact there might be a young female inside the residence, um, after I forced the door, like I said, the environment was what we'd call tenable, it was very normal. Um, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to go in and do a quick lap within this little living room area off to my right. Again, Your Honor, an object is not responsive to the question as to how he entered the home. Sorry. So, sorry. So, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, my question was how you entered the home. You answered that, and then you kept going. So, I'm going to, I'll ask the questions. And, oh, oh sorry. that's okay. How have you been trained in entering? Uh, homes like this? Um, like I said, we would do, typically we would enter with pairs of two. Um, if it was a very heavily smoke environment, no visibility, uh, we would enter and we would do a, we would either call out or determine uh, what's called a right hand or left hand search. We would stay to a wall. Uh, we would go in and we would stay that wall and eventually if you go in on the right, you'll wind your way all the way back out. So it's, it's kind of a, a training method that we use to do. And were you wearing a mask at the time? No, I was not. Does your training tell you you need to be wearing a mask? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, why did you decide to forego your training for that portion? We were told there was possibly an eight-year-old girl inside that house. Okay. Describe what you saw and what you did upon entering the home. So when I uh, forced the door, and I, I don't remember if I kicked the door or just shouldered the door or it was unlocked and I opened the door. I, I, I don't recall that. Um, like I said, when I opened the door, um, after picking myself up from falling, um, I turned around. I didn't have any crew. I didn't have anybody there. The conditions to me were very tenable. Um, I said, uh, told myself, this, this, this is where you put your, your money where your mouth is. This is, what, this is where I earn my keep. Um, I went into the right, I just made a quick loop into the residence, and very quickly the conditions were changing uh, dramatically. And I was like, uh-oh, I need to get out of here. Um, I came around to what was like a wood stove, and as I came to that entryway, there was a gigantic ball of fire coming at me, and I dove out the front entry of the door. Uh, once again, unceremoniously landing on my face. Um, and got up and turned just in time to have the fire blow out over the top of me and blow the two adjacent windows to the front of the, entry, the front of the home out. Have you ever heard of the term uh, backdraft? I have, sir. Not the movie, the term? Yes. Describe to the jury what a backdraft is. So a backdraft is not at all like the movies. Uh, backdraft is actually where a fire has burned and consumed all available oxygen within a room, a box. All the furniture, everything is charred, the temperatures are in excess of a thousand degrees, and someone opens a door or a window, someone breaks a window and interjects a fresh set of oxygen, uh, 
air, and it just ex reignites with explosive force. It's tremendous explosion, very, very rare in a fire ground. In my 22 years, I've never seen it, um, never seen a backdraft other than the movie. So it's a very rare occurrence, but it's, like I said, it's associated with a tremendous amount of heat as well as um, uh, uh, fire. You indicated that you've never seen a backdraft, so oh, sure. I think I know the answer to this. Was this a backdraft? No, sir. What was the difference? No heat. There's no heat, but I had already supplied the fresh source of oxygen. If I, when I went to that door, our standard would be to we check for heat. We would look for heat. Uh, the front of the door wasn't discolored. There was no char. There was no pressurized smoke. There was no indicators to tell me that behind this door was a tremendous amount of heat. When I opened the door, there was no heat. There was nothing. I didn't have my mask on. I didn't. I mean, I would have felt the heat. Typically, on a residential fire, you can't get within 10 feet without covering up because the heat is so intense on your skin. There was none of that inside that residence when I opened the door. You have responded to hundreds of fires. Yes, sir. As part of your training, do they teach you what causes fires, what causes the things you're seeing? Yeah, part of that, part of our training is uh, basic cause and determination uh, uh, with our fire investigators, our fire marshal's office, um, as well as part of my education is, formal education is fire investigation, but I am not a certified fire investigator for insurance company purposes or anything like that, but we are taught what typically causes fire, fire behavior is part of our, from, from day one in the fire service, fire behavior, fire growth, um, and then also cause and determination. Based upon your training and experience, do you have an educated guess as to why a fireball suddenly exploded behind you? My thought is it hit, it hit a, I was thinking propane cylinder, uh, gasoline, I was thinking flammable liquid or flammable gas. In firefighter terms, what are those things called? Well, it wouldn't be a flashover either. Uh, I would arson. That's what you'd call it. I mean, I, I wouldn't. There wouldn't be a. Uh, it wouldn't call it a, a, a term of a smoke explosion or anything like that or backdraft. Uh, flammable liquid fire. Arson fire. After you dove out of the house unceremoniously on your face. Yes. Um, where did you go from there? Um, at that point, I came out, uh, picked myself up. At that point, I started putting my mask on. Uh, my driver, firefighter Scott Russell, he came up. He, too, tripped over the little hoops. Um, I helped him up. We got up. We put our mask on. As we were putting our mask on, um, I, since I had started first and he was now getting back up, I directed some water into the entry of the home. Um, and then I had a report over the radio uh, from uh, Lieutenant Mike Johnston, who was requesting all hose lines be deployed to the Charlie side of the home. And remind us? The back side of the home. Thank you. Okay. Um, and what happened next? Um, I took the, I told Scott Russell we need to move the hose line to the Charlie side of the house. So we picked up the charged hose line and started kind of inchworming. And it's once you deploy a hose line, it's very difficult to remove it to the back side of the home. So there's quite a bit of going back and forth between the garage and the vehicles that were parked in the front in the driveway down the pretty very tight area between the neighbor's fence and the side of the home to get the hose line to the Charlie side of the house. And were you ultimately able to do that? Yes. We were able yeah. to get the hose line. And based upon what you were seeing, uh, where was the fire burning at this time? Most of the fire, when we got to the Charlie side of the home, uh, most of the fire was burning in what I, was the back of the garage and out of a rear slider double door on the back side of the home. Uh, the home had two sliders. One was more ground elevated with like a, a patio or a deck. And the other one was up above where like an unfinished walkway or something. There was nothing there. It was just a, about three or four feet up another set of double doors. There was no fire coming out of the left-hand side of the home. Most of it was coming out of the right-hand side. Okay. Yeah. Is this a good place to take a break? Excellent. I'll try to slow down. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually going to take a break.
lunch break. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to do with the speed of your testimony. Uh, you can step down. All right, sir. Folks, we're going to take our lunch break at this point in time. If you would, please put the cover over your notepad. Take those notepads back with you to the jury room. Leave them in the jury room during lunch break. I don't want to have access to them. I don't want people to read them. Remember my admonition about discussing this case with anyone. Again, you're, you're free to contact your work or other folks that you need to talk to. Be prudent in your conversations with them. Um, do you folks have any questions for me at this point? Have a good lunch. I'll see you back here. Are we ready to go at 1 o'clock today? So let's uh, gather up back into the jury room, just about 10 to 1. We'll try and get started at 1 o'clock or as soon there too as humanly possible. Okay? Thank you very much. Have a good lunch. It will be a recess. All right. Go ahead.